Hi, and welcome to the Richmond Pre-Op Hip Joint Replacement Surgery class. This talk should take approximately an hour, and in your package, you should have received a cheat sheet and copies of the exercise and education booklets for you to refer to. If you haven't received it as yet, it is in the mail. The overall information will apply to any hospital, and as most of you are having your surgery here in Richmond, uh, there are some specifics for the Richmond surgeons that I will point out. I would like to acknowledge the land uh, that we are gathered on today, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. So the objective today is to go over the joint precautions, uh, give you an idea of what to expect before and after the surgery, uh, prepare your home, identify any equipment needs and what the recovery will look like. And uh, to remind you that uh, being set up reduces your anxiety and, uh, and practicing uh, reduces your anxiety. From our point of view, the majority of you are safe to climb the stairs after surgery and to walk. Immediately after the surgery, you, you are uh, helped by a physiotherapist and a nurse to get up and walk. And then the physiotherapist does review the stairs and away you go. If you feel that you do not want to climb the stairs when you get home, then please prepare your space at home prior to coming to surgery. Uh, make sure that you've got somebody to help you through your journey, so a, a partner in your care. This person will need to be able to uh, help you uh, to get to your appointments, help you with meals, groceries, laundry. The physical help is not so much uh, with your walking or helping you get in and out of bed. Those things you can do yourself, walking, getting to the bathroom, showering, you can do that all by yourself. The physical help is more physically uh, getting the groceries and doing all those other things I mentioned earlier, the meals and things like that. And if you have pets, taking the pets out and taking the garbage out and things like that. Uh, in Richmond, we do discharge people as early as the same day of surgery. So um, please let the person know if you've had a discussion with your surgeon where they said, look, we've identified you as a same day discharge. Uh, you're going to go home within so many hours of your surgery. So um, it could be into the evening. So don't think that after five o'clock that the person's not coming home. It could be, you know, it could be later um, uh, into the evening that we would still uh, identify you as a same day discharge and send you home as long as you're medically stable. So just uh, we don't want to have any surprises and you don't want to have any surprises when you come get that call. So at home, uh, from now until surgery, anything that you can do to maintain and improve your fitness and function will help. Short walks, uh, doing the sit to stand exercise, in sitting, lifting your leg up into the air and moving it in and out. Eating as healthily as you can, cutting out the excess sugars, decreasing smoking and alcohol consumption as these increase your risk factors and sort out your home like we mentioned. Declutter, get up the rugs, um, make sure that you can get your around uh, from the bedroom to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the dining room, to the TV room. And then, like I said, I uh, usually suggest that people do their laundry and their bedding before they come in. So they don't have to worry about that. And then, like I say, practice with the equipment, organize things, organize your kitchen heavy and often used pots and pans. Put them at the waist level so you're not bending down and just keep things with an arm's reach because you don't want to be bending forward, right? Remember about the, the 90 degrees. And then for those of you that live alone, it is still possible to, to have the surgery. You can still uh, prepare yourself, prepare your meals in advance, freeze them uh, so that you can just uh, uh, defrost them in the microwave and then look around your home, right? Because you'll be using a walker, you can't, um, carry things, but you can you can attach a basket to your walker, uh, sort of uh, MacGyver it and, and zap strap a small basket so you can put little items on it and then you can uh, get to the table. And then look at your countertops. If you take something out of the microwave, you put it on the countertop, okay, if I've 
lift this up and put it onto the table over here. I can walk over there and then just do through three steps and move it down the counter. And then if I, I can get to the table there and I can eat. So just sort of think that little plan through. Uh, stay healthy. Uh, I would advise you at this day and age to keep your masks on when you go out, because if you get sick, you can't have your surgery. So uh, you would need to call your surgeon and let them know that you're sick. Uh, and then we would just uh, reschedule your, your surgery. So with the hip, there are hip precautions and uh, I will go, uh, give you an overview of them and then the hospital staff will go over some more with you. And then each surgeon has their little list of do's, uh, do's and don'ts. And I've tried to put them in for the Richmond uh, patients on the cheat sheet. And the, these precautions can last up to 12 weeks, depending on your surgeon. And so you would have to have a, a, a deeper conversation with them when the time comes as to when they would lift up certain precautions. So they're very important because we want to protect the joint. And that's why we, we go on and on about them so much. So uh, this picture here, if you um, look at it, basically the top three things we don't want you to do is we don't want you to uh, uh, bend your hip past 90 degrees. We don't want you to cross your feet and we don't want you to twist. So if you look at the picture of the person lying in bed, think of your um, belly button as a border and uh, you don't want to cross the border. So you don't want to cross your feet. So you put a pillow between your knees to remind yourself not to cross your feet. And then uh, in if you're lying on your side, you just put a pillow between your knees and you can lie on your side. That's not a problem. The sitting is, uh, again, we want you to stay at 90 degrees. So if you look at the picture of the lady there, her knee is below her hip. That's sort of the, the tip there. And if you see her leaning forward, she's now broken 90 degrees. So we don't want you to do that. And if she puts her um, foot on a footstool, the knee is above the hip and she's broken 90 again. So we don't want you to do that. And then the other thing is if you're standing and somebody calls your name and you twist and look behind you to see them, we don't want you to do that. So if you're standing and somebody calls your name, move your feet so that you, you turn your whole body to, to face them. And like I said, that could take up to 12 weeks depending on the surgeon. So the importance of the 90 degrees would be in sitting and uh, so your chair and your toilet height. So you, we will go over that later on in the talk uh, so that you have uh, some of the equipment to maintain the 90 degree uh, precaution. So for those of you in Richmond who are having your surgery done by Dr. Johnson, uh, once you are allowed to bend forward, he does not want you to bend outside of your knees. So if you look at the picture, the model there, she's reaching for something, her slippers on the uh, outside of her feet. He, that's a no-no for him. And sometimes with some patients for him, that's a permanent precaution. So what I would suggest that you do is that you have a conversation with him as to when he's going to lift that. And then in order for you to pick up an object, what you would do is have that object between your knees and between your feet so that you're going straight down to pick that, that up there. Uh, for Dr. Gatha, for the first six weeks, he does not want you to take your leg out to the side as an exercise. And for those of you that are having an anterior hip approach in Richmond, uh, I realize that this is very conservative and the doctors realize that it is very conservative. Uh, but this is the way it is right now until they, they decide to be a little bit more adventurous. For the first four weeks, for patients who are having an anterior hip approach, the same thing. They don't want you to cross your legs. They don't want you to twist your surgical hip in or out. They want you for sure to use your walker and your crutches for the first four weeks, even if you feel very good. Uh, they don't want you to take your leg out to the sides as an exercise for the first four weeks. They don't want you to force the knee, the hip, sorry, past 
uh, extend the neutral extension. So they don't want you to take your leg behind you for the first four weeks. And the exercise of lifting your bum up off the bed, they don't want you to do that until uh, the wound is healed. So that takes about four weeks. So don't sort of, you know, you can lift it up a little bit to move in the bed, but not as an exercise where you're lifting it high up into the air. Equipment, what are you going to need? So there are a few things and I will describe each thing as we go along the way and whether or not it would apply to you. So uh, before I forget, in at the Richmond Hospital, they do sell the two wheel walker and the crutches. If you choose that, that you don't want to rent or you don't want to borrow from the Red Cross, they do sell those. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, a, a walker should not cost you more than $55. Um, they range between $35 to $55, depending on the size and the height. And then the crutches are $31 at this point in time. The um, Red Cross information, we'll go that, through that later for me to fill out the form for you. Okay, so we'll just go over, see what it is you need and how we go about that. So walking equipment, we recommend uh, a two-wheeled walker for most people, and that's the picture in the middle. We do not recommend a four-wheeled walker. That's the one with the X on it. Simply because it, it can move one way as you're trying to get back on your feet. And if it goes one way and you go the other way and you lose your balance and you trip and you fall, then you will be in trouble after having a significantly um, important surgery for yourself. So the uh, handle height for all, for the cane, for the uh, walker and for the crutches, the handle height is all at the wrist joint. So if you see the model there, the person standing and then the red line going through, that would be the handle for all of them. For crutches, the part that goes against your armpit should be two to three fingers below the armpit. It doesn't jam into your armpit. There are nerves in your armpit that if you uh, put too much pressure on them, you would actually end up damaging them. So we don't want you to do that. Uh, and the handle actually pushes against your chest as opposed to shoving up into your armpit. And uh, did I forget anything else? Yes. The, we generally recommend the item in the middle, the two-wheeled walker, because that's the most stable. Uh, crutches, I would only recommend to somebody who has used them in the last year or two and is quite confident using them. If you've not used them in the last couple of years, I would suggest you stick with the walker. Now, the videos that I'm going to show you about using the um, stairs patient is using a crutch, but you can definitely use a cane. So you don't need a crutch to go up and down the stairs. You can use the cane and most of you are probably already doing that in any case. So you would just use the cane that you have right now. So the next video I'm going to show you is the um, model using the two wheeled walker. And what I would suggest is um, as you're watching the video, the, per the model's trouser leg or the pant leg is rolled up and that indicates the surgical leg. After surgery, some people first use a two-wheeled walker. This walker allows you to move faster and it slides easier on carpet. As with the standard walker, press down through your arms, step into the walker with your surgical leg, and follow with your good leg. The handles of the two-wheeled walker should be at the wrist crease when you're standing straight with your arms at your side. So the next video is about stairs and uh, what I would suggest is that you practice. Uh, most of you are anxious. If you are worried about stairs, please practice uh, and watch the video which I will um, show you later on and we do send you the link of the video. Uh, the video does show the person using the uh, crutch, but like I said, you can use a cane to go up and down the stairs. Please practice. Uh, we will discharge you home uh, 
not having practice stairs at home is not a barrier or a reason for us not to discharge you at home. Uh, for some patients, uh, especially those patients that are going home the same day, you may not actually practice with us in the hospital. So it's really important that you practice prior to coming in. So again, the model uh, over here, the rolled up trouser leg is the operated leg. And he's using a crutch, but you can use a cane. And it doesn't matter which side the reeling is on, the cane would be on the opposite side. A trick to remember how to correctly go up and down stairs is to think of the good or non-surgical leg going up to heaven and the bad or surgical leg going down to hell. So, when going up the stairs, lead with the good non-surgical leg. Grasp the railing and move your good leg up one step, followed by your crutch and then the surgical leg. Continue this way one step at a time. When going downstairs, grasp the railing, place the crutch one stair below, and step down with the bad or surgical leg. Follow with the good or non-surgical leg. Repeat one step at a time. So um, a high density foam cushion is something that I would recommend for people who are five foot three and taller. Otherwise, um, I find that people who are below that height, generally, if you sit down in a chair, I doubt that your knee is above your hip, right? So remember in the beginning, I said, when you're sitting to maintain the precaution of 90 degrees, your knee should be below your hip. And that's why taller people require a high density foam. So how do you know what height of high density foam cushion you need or a toilet, raised toilet seat? So you mark the bend of your knee and you mark two inches above that and go stand next to the chair that you'll be sitting in. From the chair, measure up to that two inch mark above your knee and see what the distance is. And that will be the height of high density foam cushion and raised toilet seat that you will require. And so let's say, for example, you go to somebody's house, you've forgotten your cushion and you're like, oh, my knee is going to be above my hip. What do I do? Slouch and straighten your knee. As soon as you do that, your knee will be below your hip. So that's a good trick to remember, okay? And so you've maintained the 90 degree. And if you lean back, right, you open up your hips, so then you're not, you're not approaching 90 degrees. So I would, I would suggest you go around the house and, and figure out what size uh, that you need, okay? And like I say, uh, people who are a smaller, I tend to say, sit on the chair first, is your knee above your hip? If it isn't, you don't need a high density foam cushion. I would not use a, a pillow um, because it tends to collapse. So the high density foam is a, is a, is a foam that doesn't collapse. These here and again, the, the uh, rolled up leg is the operated leg and the operated leg is the one that you would uh, straighten out before you sit down. The best chair to use after hip or knee surgery is one that has a sturdy back and armrests. If a surface is below your kneecap, use a high density foam cushion or bed blocks to raise the height. Make sure the chair is two inches above knee level to maintain hip precautions. Sitting on higher firm surfaces makes it easier to get on and off chairs or beds. To sit, Back up to the chair until you feel it against your legs. Extend your surgical leg. Reach back for the armrests and slowly lower yourself onto the chair. Note the hips are higher than the knees. To properly get out of the chair, slide your hips to the seat edge and extend your surgical leg.
Push up from the chair using your hands on the armrests and your good leg. So the tips for getting in and out of bed in the hospital, they will give you a leg lifter and I would suggest that you take it home with you uh, or you could use a bathrobe tie or a towel. And the trick is to slide as much of yourself onto the bed as you can. So in the past, I've told patients to put a clean garbage bag under yourself, under your bum so that as you slide up the bed, it helps you um, glide up easier and the more of your thigh you get on the bed the easier it is going to be to get in and out of bed uh, and um, then you can use that leg lifter the ribbon to sort of help loop around your foot and then get in and out of bed again and again if you lean backwards away from your feet so if you lean back you're opening up your hip you're not going to hit 90 degrees and then you can go uh, and slide into the bed Make sure your bed is two inches or more above the top of your knee. To get into bed, back up to it. Extend the surgical leg. Using your good leg and arms, slide back on the bed. Slowly turn your body, bringing your strong leg into the bed first, followed by your surgical leg. To get off the bed, slide your body to the edge of the bed. Slowly lower your surgical leg off the bed and turn your body until you're sitting up. Extend your surgical leg and use your arms and good leg to lift yourself from the bed. So bathroom equipment, uh, as I mentioned, that if you're five foot three and below, you, you generally don't need a raised toilet seat because if you get a raised toilet seat, now your feet are dangling and uh, you know you, you're going to be unsafe uh, so what do you use to get because you feel that you need a little bit of help to push yourself off the toilet then a toilet safety frame is something that i would probably recommend to you that's the picture in the middle for patients who are closer to six feet i generally recommend the commode because uh, the higher toilet seats tend to wobble a little bit and so you feel a little bit un unsafe again uh, the the commode does raise up and it sits over the toilet and it comes with the shield so all the waste is directed down into the toilet so it it, it is i think it's a better a safer option so those are a couple of things that i would recommend there and uh, we talked about how to measure the the height of the toilet seat for you the next video shows you uh, how to get on and off the toilet. As with a chair or bed, the toilet seat needs to be two inches above the top of your knee. A raised toilet seat can bring the surface to the proper height. It's important to support your arms when getting on and off the toilet. You can attach to the wall a safety frame that fits around the toilet or some raised toilet seats have built-in armrests. If you're not using armrests, the bathroom countertop should be close enough so that you can push up from it to stand. To sit, back up to the raised toilet seat as you would to a chair or bed. When you feel the toilet behind your legs, extend your surgical leg, bend your good leg slightly, and using both arms, lower yourself onto the seat. To get up, slide forward on the seat, extend your surgical leg, then use your good leg and arm strength to push up. Make sure you press up on both armrests so that the device remains steady. Never use a towel rack or toilet paper holder to pull yourself up from the toilet. These could easily come away from the wall and cause you to fall. If you need extra support in the bathroom, consider installing grab bars. So uh, in the bathroom, I would suggest that you, if you have a bathtub, that you get a tub transfer bench or a bath bench. And if you have a walk-in shower, that you get a shower chair. Simply because if you are going to lose your balance or get dizzy, this is where it usually happens. Your blood pressure drops, you get dizzy, you, you 
and you fall uh, and then that that's not good. So the same as the toilet seat and the high density foam cushion, you want the um, height of the chair or the bench to be two inches above the knee joint. A uh, handheld shower is highly recommended for hip patients because uh, uh, A, it allows you to di direct the water where you want it and B, it stops you from leaning forward, which would uh, break hip precautions. So I'm just going to play the video for you now. Use a tub transfer bench to get in and out of the bathtub. Two legs of the bench are in the tub and two are outside. Adjust it so that it is two inches above your knee height. To get in the tub, back up to the bench. Extend your surgical leg and hold onto the back of the bench chair. Slide back on the chair and swing your legs into the tub. Don't reach forward for the taps if you've had hip surgery because this breaks hip precautions. To avoid leaning forward, attach a handheld shower hose to the bench and turn the water on before getting into the tub. To get out of the tub, bring your legs to the side and swing them over the bathtub. Slide to the end of the bench, hold onto the back of the chair, extend your surgical leg, and then push with your arms and good leg to stand up. Use a non-slip bath mat both inside and outside the tub. So dressing equipment is required for hip patients. The, uh, again, that's to uh, maintain your hip precautions. A long handle shoehorn, you probably already have one. If you don't have one, then the IKEA children's section is probably the cheapest place that I have found or the dollar store. And the reachers, I have found them at the dollar store and at Canadian Tire. They tend not to be as uh, robust as some of the ones that you find in the medical equipment stores, but um, they, they get the job done. The sock aid, I've only found at the uh, medical equipment stores. So, um, those three items you need to help you get dressed. Now I'm going to show you a video as to how they work. To dress and undress, sit in a chair or on a bed. The surface should be two inches above your knee. To put on pants, take the long handled reacher and pull the pant leg over the operated leg first, then the good leg. Move to the edge of the chair, Extend the surgical leg, stand up, and pull up the pants. When undressing, use your long-handled reacher to undress the good leg first, then the surgical leg. After hip surgery, you need to use the long-handled reacher for the first three months to maintain your hip precautions of not bending and twisting. After knee surgery, you may have some difficulty getting dressed, so these adaptive dressing tools help you to be more independent. Using an aid to put on socks is required for three months after hip surgery and can be very useful after knee surgery. Slide the sock onto the sock aid. The sock heel should be along the curved bottom with one inch of sock in the gullies. Hold on to the string and place the aid on the floor. Slowly work your foot into the sock until your toes touch the end of the sock. Now pull on the strings. The aid slips out and the sock moves onto the foot. To remove socks, just slip a long shoehorn into the sock behind the heel. Ice packs are really helpful after this surgery. People are always surprised that there's bruising, that there's swelling, uh, but that does happen after the surgery. And so the ice packs really, really help. 
Uh, most of the surgeons, if you have the extended health, will suggest that you get the cryotherapy or the ice machine. The hospital in Richmond also does sell uh, the uh, ice machine. And when you speak to the nurse, when you do your pre-admission, that is the time to let them know that you want to purchase it. And then after surgery, it shows up next to your bed. The uh, if you don't have extended health and you can't get the ice machine, don't worry. You just have to be a little bit more diligent and you can use a gel pack or an ice ice, uh, ice pack. And you just have to be um, mindful with both of them that you don't want to use it for more than 15 minutes and that you must have a cloth between you and uh, your skin and the ice. Uh, regardless of what kind of machine you are using or ice pack you are using because of the if it if it's in direct contact with your skin you'll get a frostbite or an ice burn okay the therapeutic uh, value uh, of ice is uh, best at 15 minutes after 15 minutes it's not as helpful so i generally tell people uh, to take it off and i i tell people that you should be icing every two to three hours uh, because you're going to be asked to walk or do your exercises every two to three hours when you're at home. Uh, you need about three of, uh, three uh, ice packs or gel packs if you're going to go that route. So um, one is on, in use, one will have just been put back into the freezer and the third one will be frozen. So that's generally the the the, the way we, we think about it. If you're using the ice machine, uh, then uh, the cooler part, I suggest that you use some used water bottles or some yogurt containers and you freeze them uh, to take up the volume of the cooler. And that will be your ice pack and that'll save you running back and forth to the uh, gas station to get bags of ice and then you would just uh, have two sets and put one in the freezer and one in the, the canister or the cooler and then you would add your water and it tends to stay cold longer when you do it that way if you're renting the machine then they will ask you to purchase the uh, cuff and on your cheat sheet uh, uh, in all that information, I did give you the name of places where you can rent as well if you want. So what happens between now and surgery? If you haven't spoken to the nurse uh, it, at the pre-admission clinic, it's where they do an interview with you and you go over your health history again and your medications and instructions for surgery. And if you need any special lab tests or x-rays, this is where they'll tell you all about it, okay? To meet an, an, an anesthetist or any other specialist, that's where they'll also arrange all of that. You have a date, but you don't have a time. And so you won't get your time until the day before your surgery. For a Monday, they generally call you by Friday afternoon, and then you will just follow the directions that the nurse has given you. And to come to hospital, what do you, do? you bring your care card and you bring a minimum toiletries, loose clothing, uh, good walking shoes, right? You don't want to wear slippers because even though it's more convenient, slippers tend to slip off your feet. And so as we're teaching you to get up and walk and climb the stairs we don't want your slipper to fall off and then you end up tripping and then uh, hurting yourself you will need your glasses and your hearing aids and if you sleep with a snoring machine or a CPAP machine you need to bring that if you've purchased or you're renting a uh, cryotherapy or an ice machine you need to bring that with you uh, anything else, money, valuables, cell phone, just give it to your family, your friend, whoever's with you, uh, bringing you to the hospital. The crutches and walker. If you are go, if you're having your surgery at UBC, you need to take everything with you. You need to take your walking aids, uh, so and you need to take your dressing aids with you. Uh, 
If you're having your surgery done at Lionsgate, St. Paul's and at Richmond, we will give you the walker to use at the hospital. The person picking you up should have the walker in the car because when we discharge you, you will need to get from the hospital from the curb to the car with your own walker. OK, uh, like I said, Richmond does sell walkers and crutches. Uh, UBC uh, sells um, a little bit, not much. I think it's mostly crutches and canes at UBC. Um, Lionsgate does sell walkers and crutches as well. And at St. Paul's, they sell uh, crutches and canes only. OK, so um, we will go through the Red Cross if that's where you want to go. That's not a problem. So just a reminder that in Richmond uh, and in most of the hospitals, we do aim to discharge you with as short a stay as possible. And so this could mean discharge within eight hours of your surgery. Once you are medically stable and cleared, we will discharge you. So please be prepared and let your family members know, or your friends know, whoever's picking you up. Of course, if you're having trouble, we're not going to discharge you. We're going to keep you. But for the most part, everything should go as planned. And um, once you're stable, we, we start to move towards the discharge there. So for the dressings, most of the surgeons use a water resistant dressing so you can have a quick shower, um, but no soaking in the bathtub, no lotions on, on the dressing or anything like that. There um, some surgeons who still use a pad and tensor and if that's uh, what they use, that's fine. In order for you to have a shower, you just have to wrap it in the plastic uh, before to keep it to keep it dry before you go in for a shower. For the water resistant dressings, the surgeons wanted us to go over them because they look very different and they can actually sort of um, surprise people as to how minimalistic they are. So I will just uh, go ahead and show you. So just to let you know that some bleeding uh, and bruising and swelling is normal after a surgery like this. So please don't be shocked and surprised if you do see a little bit of that. This is the, uh, one of the newer dressings that we use. It's called a Dermabon Pruneo dressing. And if you look at it, it almost looks like the surgeon has forgotten to put anything on you. It looks like a gauze with some Vaseline on it. It is um, breathable. So if you feel some dampness, or it's like Gore-Tex. Um, so if there's any sort of, uh, uh, dampness to come through or a little bit of blood that does come through then you just wipe it with a clean gauze uh, and it is water resistant and it is um, it's already water sealed it, it doesn't look like it but it is water sealed and it, it allows us to um, monitor your wound uh, much easier because it is water sealed uh, there's no risk of infection and it is designed to slough off within two to three weeks. And that's why we don't want you to soak and we don't want you to put lotions on it. But you can have a quick shower, um, but not soak in the bathtub. But we just wanted to show it to you so that you don't wake up and you see that and you kind of go, I think they forgot to put a dressing on. That is actually the dressing. The second dressing here is the uh, Tegaderm Clear Acrylic Dressing. And so again, it allows us to monitor the wound and uh, there is some bleeding after surgery so just to be prepared for that not to be surprised it's water resistant and it's sort of like um, it's got gel in it and it just absorbs the, the liquid and uh, again it's water resistant it allows us for, uh, to monitor the wound you can shower just don't soak in the bathtub and as uh, it, it can stay on for up to 28 days. And as it does that, it does tend to crinkle and dry up a little bit. So it looks a little bit like this. So you can see that uh, it, it's crinkly and it's dried up, but it's um, not leaking. And as long as it's not leaking, 
then just leave it alone. You know, it, it will it will look a little bit like the second the picture below and it's all wrinkly and crinkly there. Again, as long as it's not leaking, you have no signs of infection, you have no pus, then leave it alone. As it ages, the uh, edges do roll up a little bit. But as long as the dressing is in place, it's not leaking and you have no signs of infection, there's no pus, there's no fever, leave it alone and uh, just shower and just carry on. Make sure you do your exercises. The third dressing that can be used is Mepilex. It is also water resistant. This one is not see-through. You can see it's got a gauze and then it's got a water resistant um, adhesive on it. And then again, some bleeding into the dressing is normal, but leave it alone. It can stay up on for seven days. The uh, you can it you can leave it on until at least three edges uh, are stained. So if it's only one edge that's stained, leave it. If it's two edges that are stained, leave it. If it's three edges that are stained, then you should change it. And again, the nurses will go over it with you. We are not looking. If you have any signs of infection, again, you will call the surgeon. I got uh, the Prevena Plus, which is a negative pressure dressing. And when you wake up and you see this, don't panic. Nothing has gone wrong. That's the first thing to say to yourself. It's just the surgeon has felt that that dressing is the best one for you. It is water resistant. You can shower with it. The nurses will go over it with you. It has a canister, as you can see, that applies the pressure, the suction to give it the negative pressure. But again, it doesn't mean anything bad has happened. It's just one of many dressings that we can use. And like dressings have changed over the years, and we just don't want people to be surprised when they wake up. important that you let us know if you're feeling uh, nauseous, feeling like you're going to vomit, uh, then we can give you something for that. Uh, we want you to make sure that you stay on top of your pain. So we don't want you to let the pain run away. So we will be asking you to take your pain medications on time, especially for the first two weeks. Uh, the surgeons will give you blood thinners and there are many different kinds that are out in the market and the surgeons will pick the ones that they are, uh, they feel is the best one for you. And then antibiotics will be given during your stay in the hospital. So the reason we want to have your pain under control is because if it's under control, you will exercise and you will move and it will help with constipation. Nobody ever wants to talk about constipation, but if you don't move, you're, um, you, you end up getting constipated. So, Think of a traffic light and think you want to stay in the green light. If your pain is approaching orange, uh, then you should have taken something to bring it back down to green. Because if you're in the green, you will exercise, you will move, you will walk, you will do all the things we need you to do. If you wait until you're going from orange to red, it's too late. The pain will have gone up higher, the medication won't work, and you'll be, you'll be getting distressed. So using the ice, using the pain medication as directed, especially for the first two weeks will really help. It will help you with moving. It'll help with constipation. Moving will reduce your risk of blood clots. Moving will increase the range in your, 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 um, your hip and strengthen. And, and so we, we need all those things in order for you to have a successful recovery. So we have mentioned swelling and swelling can occur. So uh, you can elevate your knee. So one way of doing it is to lie on the couch and put your heel on the armrest and then fill the space up with the pillows. And then when the leg is up, you can pump your ankle so you can move your ankle back and forth. You can bend your knee, straighten your knee. You can squeeze your bum. All these things help move the blood along. And uh, if you have swelling, then uh, I would suggest that you do this along with the ice. And again, don't be surprised if you have bruising and it goes all the way down to you. Some people. 
So exercise wise, what should you do? So the exercise booklet is broken up into before surgery and then sort of zero to three weeks, three to six weeks, six to nine weeks, nine to 12 weeks, uh, like a recipe book. And you just follow the recipe. So you um, right now, before your surgery, even if it's two, three days, don't, it doesn't matter. You can do some of the exercises in the booklet uh, that are pre-surgery or before surgery. Again, that will help you a lot. And then for the first two weeks when you get home, do the exercises in the booklet and the physiotherapist in the hospital will have gone over it with you and they will have shown you the exercises. And if you've forgotten, you can follow it in the book and just follow the book. And how often should you exercise? I recommend that when you're awake, for the f every two to three hours, you should either do your exercises or go for a walk. You need to do the exercises because certain muscles have become weak and you need to strengthen them. So you need to do both. Walking well is not good. You won't walk well if you don't do your exercises. So you do those exercises for the first two weeks and then the hospital physiotherapist will complete the paperwork for physiotherapy afterwards. So as a general rule of thumb, most of you will go to the nearest local hospital in your area. Except in Vancouver, there are only some hospitals set up for joint replacement patients. And so the physiotherapist will refer you to the closest hospital that is set up for that. Now, in all areas, it is not guaranteed that the hospital physiotherapy department will be able to take you if they don't have enough staff. So in that case, if you're on the wait list and it's been two weeks since you got home from surgery, take your booklet and make an appointment with the physiotherapist privately so that they can go over and make sure that your range is OK, make sure that you're doing the correct exercises and they can check on your walking. What you don't want is a physiotherapist who just wants to put a machine on you and ice on you and then say, OK, that's it. That is not the kind of physiotherapy that you want. OK, you really need somebody that's going to go over what it is you're doing. What is your range? How are you walking? What are you using and and uh, putting you through your paces? So practice with the walker, practice with the crutches, practice the stairs, follow the recipe book and the, the physios should be we're going through the book with you. And we already talked about that you may have to arrange privately for a short period of time. If you prefer to go privately because you're very happy with the physiotherapist that you have, then that's fine. That's OK. If your surgery is under a WorkSafe BC or ICBC claim, you will know that. And so you need to talk to your case manager because your therapy will need to be done privately and you need to organize that before you come in. So when can you go to a swimming pool or hot tub or take a bath? And generally uh, six weeks after surgery, but really when you have no scab. The scab has to fall off naturally, so please don't sit there picking at it. it. It has to heal, it has to fall off naturally, and then you know that you're completely sealed and then you can go in. Mind you that we do uh, recommend that you go home uh, early. We do discharge when people are medically stable. You do better, there are less complications, and um, you just do you get on with with your exercises and with your activities much much faster can you drive uh, generally wait about six weeks you should be walking with no aid and definitely not be on any narcotics and just a reminder you have to be able to go from the gas to the brake in an emergency situation the the child or the runs out in front of you and you have to hit the brake so you have to feel confident that you can do that before you drive and in the car transfer video that I'm going to show, I suggest putting a garbage bag under the seat, um, on the seat, sorry, so that you can slide a little bit better. The more you slide on uh, your thigh onto the, uh, the seat, the easier it is for you to get in. 
Make sure the passenger seat is pushed back and the seat angle is reclined. If you've had hip surgery, place your high density foam cushion on the seat so that the seat is two inches above your knee height. Back up to the car. Extend your surgical leg. Using your arms for support, lower yourself to the seat. Slide back as far as you can across the seat. Then, bring both your legs into the car. If you've had hip surgery, make sure you maintain hip precautions. To get out of the car, ease your legs out and keep leaning back to maintain hip precautions. Extend your surgical leg and slide to the edge of the seat. Stand up using your good leg and arms for support. So for transportation, just to remind you that you will need uh, somebody to pick you up from the hospital on discharge, and then you'll need help to go to and from your appointments. Uh, so if you live alone or um, you feel you, you don't have anybody who can take you to and from your appointments, you can use the handy tart and uh, you can just contact the office over here in Richmond uh, and we can definitely help you with that form. That's not a problem. For the handicapped parking pass, you'll have to go through your family physician for that. I would not be able to help you with that. For those of you coming out of town, we do recommend that you have the travel assistance program. If you already know about that, make sure you go to speak to your family doctor to get the paperwork done. And for those of you that need to take a ferry uh, to make sure that you're on the medical assured loading so that you um, are able to get to the lower mainland to have your surgery done and you need to be on the TAP, uh, the travel assistance program in order to be on the medical assured loading program. The, uh, for people who want to fly, we don't recommend flights over two hours for the first six weeks. Uh, this is to reduce the risk of blood clots, and we do recommend that you discuss with your surgeon if you wish to fly within that time period. And so just a reminder that the cheat sheet does highlight the information that we've discussed today, and the um, three websites that I've listed over here uh, are also on your cheat sheet. OASIS is the um, Vancouver Coastal Health Education Program. Um, the Arthritis Surgical Assistance Program, um, Assessment Program, sorry, is a program that I belong to. And that is, uh, there's some information on that website as well. And for the surgeon, the Richmond Orthopedic Sports Medicine Group, they also have information on their website. And for the, if you're having your surgery through the Lionsgate uh, Surgery Group, that's the Pacific Orthopedic Sports Medicine, they have a website. And I'm pretty sure that the uh, surgeons in the complex joint uh, clinic also have uh, websites up on their office um, websites as well. If you have any questions, uh, you can give me a call at uh, the office and I'll try and answer them or you can email us and we can try and answer them. The Red Cross form, if you would like to fill that out, um, send it to us and just put on the subject Red Cross equipment and then the email address is rhasap at vch.ca and it's on the form itself. And just to remind you that the Red Cross is not free, it is by donation. And if there's no equipment at the Red Cross, then you would need to rent it. And the vendors are on the cheat sheet, places where you could rent or purchase from. Lower Mainland, these are the locations of the Red Cross offices. And when uh, my colleague or I send out an email to confirm that your order has been put through to the Red Cross, we do include the uh, address and phone numbers of the local um, Red Cross depots in uh, the Lower Mainland as well. So uh, thank you again for your time and if you uh, could kindly fill out the survey form and email that back to us that would be appreciated. It would help us to maintain our program and all the best to you as you go in for your surgery. Thank you.